the Renaissance period. The Renaissance period is from 1400 to 1600. I'm sure many of you remember from a world history class in high school or maybe here at Georgia Highlands that we often define the Renaissance by a one word definition and that's rebirth. The Renaissance has an intellectual awakening to occur during this period of time and a lot of that is due in part to the discoveries that are made from two ancient civilizations, the ancient Greek and the ancient Roman culture. The ancient Greek culture is going to impact music a great deal, but maybe the musicians are a little slow to the take of this rebirth of this intellectual awakening because the discoveries with the ancient Greek culture are greatly going to impact the Baroque period, the period that follows the Renaissance. So what's going to happen with music during this 200 year period of time is that we're going to perfect the music that's already in existence, perfect the forms that are already in existence. So at the end of the medieval period, we had developed the new texture of polyphony through the form of the organum and then the most important form, the motet. So the Renaissance is really going to be all about the motet. And I'm going to take a look at the Renaissance through a couple of composers focusing on church music from the Renaissance. Let's first discuss several influences on the field of music. Of course, the primary patron for the production of music is still the Roman Catholic Church. They are the leading group that needs music. And so many composers are still connected to that particular church. But one of the things that I think of a lot in relationship to the Renaissance is Martin Luther. And of course the German-born priest nailed his thesis to the door of the church in 1517 and thus ushered in the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther is going to model the new Protestant service after what he already knows. There's going to be a musical portion, the devotion portion, and then the communion or the Holy Eucharist. But Luther wanted the music to be different than the very prayerful, very meditational mass. He wanted the music that was going to be used to echo the meaning of the text. And that's going to be very important as we move forward. So there's going to be new music for a new church now uh, discovering in the Renaissance. Also, we have the advent of printing that comes into play during the 16th century. Composers are now able to make extra money outside of their patron position through the sale of their compositions. Now, this would have been great for Machaut during the ending of the Ars Nova, during the ending of the medieval period. He would have been able to see some of his secular songs placed into print and placed up for sale. There's also the rise of the professional artist and the amateur musician. I don't know what uh, television shows or, or movies that you love, but there's a, a television show that's very popular uh, right now that I adore, and it's called Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey has just finished its fifth season, and it's going to have one more season to finish the story up. But the story traces um, the plot of a, an English well-to-do aristocratic family, and the story begins around the time of the sinking of the Titanic. And the family hosts a lot of different family members and guests that come over for visits. They have these elaborate dinners, and then after the dinner is over, they go down into a parlor or a living room, and some of the girls sing uh, on occasion for some of their guests. Well, that's what was happening in the Renaissance. A lot of uh, middle-class families and uh, higher had children who learned instruments or learned to sing, and then they would purchase these compositions because of the advent of printing. They would learn this music, and then they would perform it for the guests. Well, let's say you're a composer uh, living in 1550, and so you've finished off of a few popular songs, and you rush down to your local market, and you have it put into print and put up for sale. And then you go back in a month's time to collect your check. But you notice as you enter that there's four of those songs that are still on the shelves collecting dust. 
but then the other one is sold out. So you start to wonder, well, why was that one so popular? Why were the others obviously a failure? Well, that's because that one probably had a very memorable, very popular, very sweet sound to it. These amateur and professional musicians are going to purchase music that they love, that they do not mind spending the time to learn and perfect and then perform again and again and again. So this is going to change the focus of the composer's mentality as they're putting together a piece of music. Music prior to this had a very primal, very earthy nature to it. But the music in the Renaissance is going to be much more pleasing to the ear, much more smooth. And so a lot of that comes together right now during this couple of centuries. But it's all about the motet. Again, the motet was invented by Periton, and the original concept was to have multiple lines of melody, each melody with its, a separate text. Now the compositions that we're going to focus on only have one text. Remember that was an alternative for the composers. The motet um, is used for both sacred and secular purposes. So this was something that even though it was born in the church, it was owned by the church. It was owned by the field of music. And so musicians were uh, dabbling with this in a, a number of different ways. Some of you may have been to the Atlanta Renaissance Festival before, actually. Again, during this time when I'm taping this, it's May, and so the Renaissance Festival is in swing. I've been several times before, <clears throat> excuse me, and you're able to hear madrigals, you're able to hear uh, dance music at the Renaissance, and all of that normally has a multitude of different melodies echoing the time period. And so that was the, just the new spirit of the time. People are trying to make music more memorable and more perfect for the listener's ear. So that's what's driving the period. I wanted to take a look at two composers. Now, when we were moving from 1999 to 2000, there were all these different lists that were generated. The, 100 best rock songs of all time, the 100 best movies of all time. I guess classical music didn't want to be left behind and they put together a list and it was uh, the 25 most influential composers or something to that nature. What I liked about the book was that they didn't rank the composers, they just put them into chronological order so that you could see who was influencing whom as we moved through the, uh, the different generations. And the first two people in that list are the two composers that I want to mention to you today. The first one is Josquin Dupre. Josquin Dupre was born sometime in the decade of 1440 to 1450. He came from a very um, well-to-do and influential family, so it's interesting that better records were not kept, but I've seen all kinds of birth years for him throughout that decade, and he passed away in 1521. Josquin, um, was so famous during his own lifetime that he was known by merely his first name. So you know a lot of popular artists today that just have one name. Well, Josquin was one of the first. Josquin um, was loved by one particular person, one particular uh, composer, and that person was Martin Luther. Luther was the composer of some of the first cantatas for the a Protestant church and he tried to model his composing after that of Josquin and he's quoted as saying Josquin is master of the notes which must express the notes must express what he desires while other choral composers must do what the notes dictate so Luther was a big fan and thought that uh, Josquin had a certain knack of putting his music together Josquin was born in Burgundy, which is today modern-day Belgium, and again, he was from an affluent background. So he was a composer who didn't need to worry about finding a patron position. So that allowed him a lot of freedom during his lifetime, and he traveled a lot. During his middle years, he spent um, many years in the country of Italy. Now, Italy is going to be the place where we have our intellectual awakening, our rebirth of activity and the new concepts coming about. 
at the beginning of the Baroque period. So Josquin is about a hundred years ahead of that. So he's on the cusp of the change that's coming along. While in Italy, um, he had a lot of his compositions placed into print. And so the composers in Italy were able to purchase his music and learn from it. During his lifetime, he composed over a hundred individual motets, a hundred plus anthems, if you will. And then in addition to that, he composed some complete masses because the mass is now viewed as a whole, thanks to Machaut. Well, I want you to listen to his Ave Maria motet. Josquin de Pre, Ave Maria, look that up and follow the link and, and listen to it now, please. Hopefully what you have heard by listening to this is that there's moments within the motet where you hear kind of a round-like setting. Josquin was known for imitation in his writings where a, a piece of music, a phrase in the melody would be introduced first by the sopranos, let's say. A couple of measures later, it would be echoed by the altos. A couple of measures later, echoed by the tenors and then so on and so forth, the basses would finish it out. And so if you remember singing way back in kindergarten, row, row, row your boat as a round or a cannon, where one group started and then another group followed, it's kind of that idea. But in this particular Ave Maria, the sopranos and altos sometimes are combined together and they sing a phrase, and then the next phrase is the same music but the tenors and basses are just echoing the same tune that was just initiated. So that happens a lot during this. But the most important section of the Ave Maria happens at the very end when you get to the text, O Mater Dei, Memento Mei, Amen. O Mother of God, remember me, Amen. Josquin is using polyphony for the most part in this particular motet, but at the end, now, I don't know whether he knew that he was switching to a different texture, but he did. He switched totally to homophony, where the main melody was in the top voice and all the other voices then became harmony lines in support of this. And they sing the same syllable at the same time. And so the text becomes so clear. It has such great clarity that it reaches the listener and they can understand the text. And this was earth shattering to the Italians. They thought, oh, this is, this is wonderful. The text, you can understand it. And that's going to be something that drives music for a, a number of centuries is the text or the words. So some of these things, these influences are laid down first by Josquin. After Josquin's passing in 1521, we have a few years now where Martin Luther has been around um, with his Protestant Reformation and the Roman Catholic Church has been losing a lot of members. And so the church is going to rail against that and form a committee. And so that's where I want to take up in our next section. <laughs> ¶¶